Hi everyone, this is our channel, Meet the Real Story. Please, like, share and subscribe. I am addicted to food. I suffer a lot. I need help. I've tried to give up, but I fail every time. Hamburgers. Who can give up eating hamburgers, especially with barbecue sauce? I didn't mind this kind of addiction, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me begin by introducing myself. I am Patricia, 15 years old, living with my parents and my brother. I lead a quiet life. No interests, no hobbies, except for eating, that is. Food is my faithful friend. It never leaves me. It is my partner, my soulmate. But having food as your soulmate has insidious side effects. A dark side, if you will. It denies me a healthy life, robs me of the energy to play, and causes me to sleep excessively. I would much rather stay at home with a bag of potato chips than go out and exercise. My soulmate ultimately betrayed me, though, last Thanksgiving at my granny's home. She lives in a state nearby. Granny was a clever doctor, and an excellent cook at that. She could conjure up something really delicious. On that day, she had prepared barbecue turkey with nuts and other secret recipe ingredients. The taste was so great, as if it had descended from heaven itself. I felt like I was fighting a food war, and I had to win at all costs. I ate and ate and ate. I don't know why, but I just couldn't control myself. I attacked that turkey like it was the last on the planet. But every culinary war with a worthy adversary, such as the barbecued turkey, has its own unique type of casualties. Suddenly, I found myself unable to breathe. I fell to my knees and passed out. The turkey had won. I woke up later in the hospital, though, still clinging to an unfinished turkey leg. The doctor told me that I was gaining way too much weight. He said that I should be put on a diet. Diet? Man, how I hated that word. It hung over my head like the Sword of Democles. It meant depriving me of my passion, my reason for living. I considered eating vegetables in small amounts to be the worst form of cruel and unusual punishment. The worst form of torture imaginable. Imagine thinking of a wonderful, greasy, cheese-laden pizza with all the toppings and then suddenly opening your eyes to find a healthy green salad bowl. But I had reached a turning point in life. One day, my brother was playing on the street. While I was sitting at home, gazing longingly at a tempting piece of cheesecake, just sitting there, taunting, daring me to eat it, I struggled mightily to resist the urge. But in the end, I succumbed and wolfed it down like a starving animal. Shortly afterwards, I began feeling dizzy, but I was unable to call for help this time. And then, I passed out again. I was taken to the hospital. While lying in the hospital bed, half-conscious, I overheard the doctor say to someone, she needs to stop eating or it will be the death of her. I thought to myself, whoa, death? So I made up my mind right then, right there. I resolved to fight a new war, a war against my appetite. On our way back home, I told my father that I wanted to see a nutritionist. He was delighted to hear that. Later, at the clinic, the doctor welcomed us in. She told me how to overcome my eating fetish. She gave me a strict diet regimen, with a schedule full of healthy meals. I kept telling myself that winning this war was possible. I simply had to be patient and persevere. I stuck to the strict diet and did some physical workouts. My parents supported me wholeheartedly. I was enthusiastic. I can totally do this. A week passed quickly, and I eagerly visited the doctor to receive some good news. When the doctor weighed me and told me that my weight hadn't changed at all, I was crestfallen. She looked at me and asked me, how was this possible? I told her I didn't know, because I was following her diet thoroughly, though it did require a tremendous effort on my part. Another week passed, and again I went to the doctor. The results were the same. She said to me, Patricia, are you sure you're following the diet I prescribed for you? I said yes. She sat there wondering. Then she told me with a puzzled look on her face, it's odd, but your weight is increasing, not decreasing. This unexpected piece of news mystified me. Another week passed. No change. The doctor was nonplussed. I returned home with a dejected look on my face. My father asked me what was wrong. And when I told him, he laughed. Do you believe that? My father actually laughed at my predicament. I was furious. He gestured an apology with his hand and then told me that it was my own fault. 
I was puzzled. What are you talking about? He told me that I had been sleepwalking to the refrigerator every night and eating everything in sight. I was taken aback. I couldn't believe it. Stop acting like he didn't know it, he said. You must have been awake. I replied, no, father, I'm not acting. I was truly unaware that I've been sleepwalking and eating in my sleep. But now that we've finally solved the mystery of the increasing weight, we returned to the doctor with this new information and told her the situation. She laughed and told me that my discipline had denied my body the food it craved, but my brain had refused to cooperate and had overridden my will by urging me to eat in a subconscious state. She told me not to worry, though, that she could treat that. Armed with this knowledge and her support, and the support of my family, I felt that I could finally win this war. Hello, my name is Brenda, and this is how I embarrassed myself when I was about 14 years old. Before I tell you my story, let me highlight a few points. All teens experience some amount of anxiety at times. It is actually a normal reaction to stress, and sometimes it even helps them deal with overwhelming situations. For many, many teens, things like public speaking, final exams, or even going out on a date can cause feelings of anxiety. For some teens, however, anxiety can go beyond these typical symptoms to negatively affect friendships, participation in activities, and even their schoolwork. And do not get me started on how being a teenager is made of the devil's blood. Okay, that was an innocent joke, but I do mean it. So, back to our story. I was sitting in class behind the cutest guy in my grade. His name was Josh, and I just wanted to ask for his phone number. But I was painfully shy and terribly afraid of being rejected. But it was almost time for the school dance. I wanted to go with him, but there was no way on earth I could have done it face to face. I tried to talk myself through the anxiety and convinced myself to actually go through with it. I debated with myself for a while, missing most of that day's in-class instructions before I finally decided to ask him. And I did. I did ask Josh for his number, and he agreed. He slowly took my phone, typed in his number, and handed it back to me. I felt relieved. I had finally gotten the number. I mean, I was wrong. There was nothing to be anxious about. I had made it much worse in my mind than it actually was. It was actually nice to realize I was anxious over nothing, to be over it and have his number. I got home later that day and I was so excited to call or text Josh. But because I'm socially awkward, I decided to try and text him. But the message didn't deliver. I checked the number he gave me and noticed that it included the digits 911, which indicated to me that he had given me a fake number. Maybe he was trying to avoid me. I suddenly became aware of how weird I had acted towards him. I didn't have much of a relationship with the guy before asking for his number. There was no rapport between us, so it came across as creepy when I asked him. I also asked him in the middle of class by tapping him on the shoulder. There was nothing smooth or even normal about how I went about it. I hadn't acted immoral, but it was painfully awkward, socially inappropriate and thus doomed to fail. The encounter was painful, but from it I suppose I learned some lessons on how to appropriately socialize. I also learned that it is incredibly easy to miss obvious signs that other people are giving you when you're anxious, because you're so absorbed with yourself that you miss social cues. Looking back at how he was clearly uncomfortable with my request, which he made clear by not smiling and by hesitating in agreeing to type the number. Had I gotten out of my head and paid attention, I might have noticed how he was acting and how that clearly reflected how he felt about me and our interaction. It makes me question, is having high-functioning anxiety easier than being trapped in your own shell? Frozen with anxiety? It may be the lesser of two evils. But for me, this experience turned into purpose, and it built my self-confidence. I see it as a step, but then improving self-esteem and self-worth will have you high-functioning without anxiety. That is the end game. But you know what? Write your own script. You can't go on if someone else is writing your script. And I know that a lot of kids at school felt the same way. They didn't feel good, and I didn't know why. Kids will relate, and this is so freaky, and it makes anxiety even worse. You have to go to know that you are okay in school, and you cannot know unless you go. Getting over anxiety is not some hippie mumbo jumbo, and it took me years to get over what I call life fright, and I learned that the very hard way. Now, does the devil joke make sense?